if my salary goes up 3% a year, I can only afford 3% more in rent. That is complete and utter nonsense. Let's get ready to scale. Hey guys, welcome to yet another episode of Ready to Scale. This week we have two returning guests. One, my associate Ryan. Ryan, would you like to say hello? Hi, everyone. So I'm the acquisitions associate here at Blue Lake Capital. I, I make um, rare appearances on, on the podcast, so I'm happy to be here. And also joining us is Neil Bawa, which some of you, I would assume all of you might even recognize, aka the mad scientist of multifamily. Neil is the CEO and co-founder of YouGrow, which actually, this sounds so interesting to me, Neil. So apparently you are now into a new venture and it's a real estate investment and development company focusing on the intersection of prop tech, fintech, and build to rent, which I am definitely going to want to know all about. In addition to that, though, Neil has also been a longstanding CEO of Grow Capitus Investments, which focuses on multifamily investments, student housing, and senior housing. He's also the CEO of Multifamily University, and originally he started off all of this with his education journey with his BS in computer science from the University of Mumbai. So Neil, welcome back to the show. It's great to have you. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be back. And and so much has changed since the last time I talked with Ellie and, and the Blue Lake Capital team. So terrific to be back. Yes. And on that note, this sounds very interesting. What you got going on there at YouGrow? Well, um, you know, I think that many of your, your viewers understand the multifamily industry, both on the um, value add side and the development side. And I've been involved in that in both of those aspects very heavily, um, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of each uh, for a while. Uh, but I believe that a new form of multifamily, a new extension of multifamily is called built rent. And, um, and we'll talk a little bit about why I believe that. But so I, I created a separate company. And interestingly, its name, you grow, actually, that the GRO part comes from my existing company, Grow Capitus. And I so I merged with a partner that I'd worked with for four years, absolutely loved them. And we said, let's just merge, you know, portions of our company together. So we merged our development division with their uh, built to rent company to form a new company called you grow. And you grow now has um about 400 investors and is in active construction for over $500 million worth of build to rent. Very interesting. And just out of my own curiosity, and I'm sure some of the listeners, can you just kind of give us the big wide angle view of how build to rent is structured from a business oh, plan? Sure. sure. Um, so build to rent is essentially uh, the, the step between a single family home right? So if you can't, for whatever reason, if you can't afford to buy a single family home, but you do not want to live in an apartment complex, you don't want to live in a high density area, built to rent is that piece in the middle. So uh, traditional townhomes are built to rent, new built townhomes are built to rent. Um, there's also what is known as uh, <clears throat> horizontal apartments, which essentially is a small single family home. So it might be 900 square feet or 1000 square feet. So in size, it's like an apartment. But it's got a, a postage stamp size backyard and a postage stamp size front yard and two units might be together just, you know, for cost reasons. So you might have two of them together, but you've got your own door. You've got your own front yard. You've got your own backyard. And then but you're in a community that also has all of the shared amenities. So you've got all the benefits of being in a multifamily, the pool, the gym, the clubhouse. But you're living in an individual unit and that's called built to rent. And it's it's an explosive new take. And, and um, you know, we'll talk today about why it's necessary, but we believe that approximately 10 million families that today are searching for a home that won't be able to afford a home over the next decade and a half will live in a build to rent facility. Very interesting. Now, um, are the qualifications for this as stringent or more stringent than getting into a typical multifamily? How are you screening the tenants? What type of tenant base do you have or customer base do you have for this? So it, it's um, definitely a more affluent customer base. So, you know, one of the things that I wanted to show today is, um, you know, there's, there's a, and this is both good news, bad news, right? So 
we what we have today in 2023 and i you know for those of you that are watching on video i'm going to throw a slide up on the screen we have today the largest gap between the monthly rental payment and the monthly mortgage in the history of our country so on the right side you see that gap the green line are rents and you can see those are rising pretty quickly right there's a pretty sharp spike there but then you look at what's happening to the mortgage payment Part of that is obviously home prices went up about 44%, 45% over the last um, you know, two, two, two and a half years. In some markets, they went up 75% uh, and one market, they even doubled. Um, and, and, but then the rest of it is obviously interest rates. So the combination of those two mean that the gap between renting and owning is the largest in history. And because of that, there's all these families that typically want to buy their own home that have been able to buy their own home Keep in mind the, the single family market's larger than the multifamily market in the United States. About 62% of Americans live in their own home. That number is shrinking continuously. And the reason it's shrinking is this gap. This gap means that the vast majority of people that are now entering the workforce or have been in the workforce in the last 10 years will never be able to buy a home. But the, 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 the catch is a lot of these people are fairly affluent. They've, they've got two jobs, they earn over $100,000. They don't wanna go live in an apartment. Right. So a significant percentage of them are going to end up living in a new asset class called built to rent. And that's what we are after. Now, that doesn't mean that people will not live in apartments. In fact, I think that what you're seeing on the screen is actually more demand for apartments than for built to rent. Built, built to rent is always going to be a smaller portion of the apartment industry, because if anything, it's it's um, it's prices, the price to, to live in a or the rent to live in a built to rent property is sort of like class A multifamily. And in cert certain cases, it can even be higher than multi class A multifamily. And because it's expensive, the people that are going to, to move into built rent will basically be 10 to 20% of these people that can't buy homes anymore. The remaining are going to go into class A apartments, class B apartments, and class C apartments, which, uh, which you know really well. But this, this gap is something that is not fully understood by people. It is the largest in history. Take a look at you know, the, the, the screen and you'll notice that the gap was pretty big in 2005, but it's almost double that size today. So even if home prices fall from here by 10%, so nationwide they fall by 10%, that gap is still going to be the largest in history. They need to fall by like 20% for the gap to become the second largest in history. And I think most people simply don't understand this. And, don't, and, and that's why they're panicked about multifamily at this point because of interest rates. And, and they have absolutely no reason to panic in the long term. I think that there are some reasons to panic in the short term, and we can talk about those. Yeah, Neil, you, you make some good points. I'm going to jump in here. I actually um, was part of the acquisition of a, a recent act deal um, last year, which we, we bought two properties about a quarter mile from one another. One was a 155 unit built to rent, brand new. Um, limited amenities, but what, what was really interesting, and you already touched on it, was the, the rent roll characteristics and, and the resident base that made up the property uh, was really interesting because it, on average, to your point, every every household was making over $100,000, $120,000 and adjacent next door, same, same year construction, um, had a younger resident base at a slightly lower income that wanted more of a lifestyle relative to more space. To you, to see, you spoke about the privacy, um, and I'm sure you have plenty of data on the number of pets uh, that people and residents now have in their homes. So the, the extra space and the, the seclusion or privacy that you have in the build to rent is really unique. And I, I saw that firsthand during um, the due diligence when we were pulling lease audits and rent rolls. It was really interesting. So what, what do you think is driving that to your point of, of the demographic of someone, a smaller portion of, of the, re the renter base looking for build to rent relative to your traditional multifamily? Um, the American dream. People, the, the country is built on the American dream. And if people can't chase the American dream by buying a home, they want to get as close to that as possible. Obviously, one option is to rent a single family home. But from what I've seen, single family homes are extremely expensive to rent so that, that a lot of people are not able to do it. Another challenge is when you do get rental homes, the rental home stock in the US is getting older and older. So the typical rental home now in the US is about 35 years old and that's you know continuously increasing in, in, um, in age because we're not building a lot of new rental homes. We're building BTR, which is a different product. And so people are, they don't want 
that old home. They want something that's new and interesting. It could be smaller than a single family home. So older single family homes are bigger. They're 1,500 to 2,000 square feet. People are okay with something that's smaller, but they want something that's more modern. Plus, they don't want to give up on all the amenities that come with multifamily. The clubhouse, the gym, the, the dog park, um, the, the pool, they don't want to give that up. And that's driving people to this in-between solution. Uh, the other thing that's driving it is nothing to do with the American dream. What's driving it is money. So as you know, the biggest success story in the last 10 years, even though multifamily has been incredibly, absurdly successful in the last 10 years, the biggest success story have been companies that bought very large number of single family homes for rent. So American Homes, uh, you know, uh, Blackstone, these companies bought 70,000 homes, 80,000 homes, 200,000 homes. As you can imagine, the value of those homes has tripled, right? Multifamily hasn't tripled yet, but we're, we're getting there. Um, and so those people, they did it. And by 2015, 2016, 2017, they'd already bought 60, 70,000 homes. Now there were no more single family homes, but they, the, the success that they had had and the incredible return that they made for their institutional investors meant that they were raising enormous amounts of capital. And they came to this conclusion that if we're not going to buy single family homes, we're going to build single family homes. And so BTR basically got invented in the 2015, 2016 timeframe. A company called Christopher Todd in Phoenix started to build smaller, you know, single family homes. And eventually they started doing two together duplexes just to cut the cost down about a thousand square feet. So same size as a uh, as a uh, apartment, uh, but a little backyard, maybe the backyard, like five, six, seven people could sit in it, that sort of backyard, you know, maybe 10 by 10, 10 by 15. And the concept was explosively successful. And, and I think you'll resonate on this immediately because you know what was the difference? It wasn't the rents that were making it very profitable, the turnover. They, they were experiencing one half to one third the turnover of apartment complexes in the same marketplace. So people were living in these homes considering that this was their home and they weren't moving out every two years or every 18 months. They were staying for four to five years. So by 2022, the data was very strong that the turnover in these properties is very low. So their, their net profits are much higher. And so in 2021, when all cra sort of crazy things were happening in the economy, a staggering amount of money, $76 billion dollars was raised to build BTR properties in the United States. And that money will take about seven years to deploy. Um, and the, the challenge is the number of homes being built in the US is about 5% of the actual money that's been raised. So you can imagine there's a lot of people sitting with money in the bank that are very frustrated, looking for developers like me that have a thousand units coming online. And so we, I already have people that are like, we'd like to buy your property when, when it's built, but we don't want to buy one of them. We'd like to buy six or eight or 12 of them together. Yeah, it's interesting you brought up the turnover because that, that's exactly what I saw. So this was a 2019 build and we were trying to understand the, the demographic at this property because it, it truly was the rent roll was differentiated from the, the property directly next door with the same interior finishes, just different product style. And we saw, and this was pre-pandemic, there were 70 to 75 percent retention rates for two consecutive years um, mm -hmm. in in renewal rates were were north of 10 percent. Um, yeah. So it just goes to show to your point, um, it, it's a, a very inelastic type of resident base and um, they, they're looking for an experience. They're looking for more than just your traditional multifamily apartment complex. So in, into your point the turn cost of that, it supports the NOI because every every move out is going to cost you um, approximately one month's rent. So you're getting the renewal increase, the retention, and it's going right to your bottom line. Exactly. And that's that's why most of the big players in the built to rent space are extremely large companies. So Blackstone obviously started this trend back in 2010 when they set up the first REIT to buy single family you know, homes. And they've they've waded into the space. They actually sold a bunch of their single family homes and then they bought another company to grow it, to grow it again. So uh, there's a lot of very, very large players. And I'm not saying multifamily players are not large, but imagine a, a big multifamily player. Now imagine somebody roughly 100 times that size. That's the size of the build to rent players. Wow, <clears throat> that is fascinating. It really is. So and it's all part of multifamily, right? Because in the end, 
this is not a single family home. It is a multifamily community. There's 200 units, there's a pool, there's a gym. It's multifamily, it's just a different kind. So then the new name that I hear for built to rent, uh, rent is horizontal apartments, right? And I think, I think that name's gonna stick because it sort of helps people understand what we're talking about here, horizontal apartments. And, and you know, I'm not stopping value add. I'm not stopping building traditional apartments. I, I continue those. I, I currently have 560 traditional apartments uh, units in construction. I think that that market will continue to grow. There's a need for it. Uh, BTR only works in certain areas. I mean, it uses a lot more land. So you can't really have BTR infill. You, you're going to have B, BTR, BTR on the edges of suburbs where land's a little bit cheaper and it's more available. So it's part of the solution, but I'm excited that something new has happened in apartments because I haven't really seen anything new in apartments in the last 40 years. I mean, you know, your company is buying apartments that are 40 years old because nothing new has happened since then. You can bring them back up and they can still be as good as new once you're done rehab rehabbing them, right? So having an, a fundamental new innovation is exciting. And Neil, from, from the development perspective, so what, what's your opinion on um, when, when you're building out the floor plans, a standalone build to rent unit relative to a side by side in the mixture of the two? Um, the short answer is most people, when they started out five, six years ago, their vision was a standalone unit. Today, nobody thinks that simply because construction costs are too high. So I think what's happening today is they're going to look more like row homes. Um, so you might have a neighbor on your left and a neighbor on your right, but you don't have a neighbor below you or above you. Um, so, and you do have that little backyard and front yard piece. So, but, but I think that uh, the BTR movement very quickly in the last 12 months has started moving to attached units rather than single family, because I, I think single family just is not going to scale at the cost. Our, 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 our rent prices are going to be too much above class A. I think 5% above class A is okay. But if you're 20% above class A, then, then you know, how many people are going to afford that, right? I know these are affluent people. I know these are people who wanted to have a mortgage. They had money saved up. So but still, I, I, I want to be in that 5% range above a class A unit to give them that front yard and backyard, which means that today, I think most people will come to the same conclusion that you have. I think you asked the question, you come to that conclusion. It's got to be attached units. The, the SFR kind of built to rent product is going to be too expensive in most markets. Agreed. Yeah. And, and what was interesting is that 5% is it, it was our rule of thumb in the underwriting. We were five to 7% depending on the unit type. So a two bedroom versus a three bedroom. Um, in addition, the standalone, I want to say the property was about 60% standalone, 40% side by side, depending on the building. Um, and we generated rent premiums of let's call it two to 3% just for the standalone relative right. to the side by side, just for the conception of um, privacy and, and true single family living with a fence, well, yard, et cetera. I love that number because my construction cost is about 10% higher if I do side by uh, if I do you know standalones so I have to generate at least a 10% premium so if you're generating 3 to 5% you're getting better value from the side by sides than you are from the from the standalones um, so I think that that's the way the industry is going to grow and this is going to coexist I mean uh, it looks like 44,000 BTR units a year seems to be the number. If you look at how much multifamily we build in the U.S., it tends to be between 250 and 400,000 units. There's 400,000 units being built right now in multifamily, maybe a little more, actually. Um, and so I think it's going to be maybe 10, 15 percent of that new construction market is going to become built to rent. But imagine a world 10 years from now where... You could go into a 300 unit community and has beautiful pools and, you know, infinity pools and things like that. And all 300 of the people that are living there are renters. There are no owners. I think this is what is going to happen in the future in the U.S. Because, you know, single family is just becoming more and more impossible from a pricing perspective. Very interesting and very true. I can agree with you on that. And along those lines, I'm glad that you're excited about the innovation that we're seeing in multifamily. I agree with you. There's a lot in multifamily right now to be excited about. So on that note, I know that you prepared a couple of additional slides for us uh, today that you're going to share. And for those of you listening, uh, we do have a YouTube channel. It's ready yep. to sell. Uh, you can always hop onto our YouTube to take a look at this also. But Neil, will you share with us some additional trends that you're seeing that are keeping you excited about multifamily and continuing to drive your dedication to it in your businesses? Absolutely. So 
uh, you know, I'll describe this uh, slide on screen for those that are that are listening. Basically, this slide shows me what rent growth in the U.S. looked like, looks like all the way from 1974 to about today. So most people think, you know, they, they hear numbers like rents go up 2% or 3% a year. Recently, it's been more like 3 to 5%, with the exception of 2021, which was a crazy year. But what most people don't know is during times of high inflation, we actually have data for 10 years of high inflation on this graph. 1974 to 1984 were high inflation years uh, in the U.S. Interest rates were all the way up to 18% during some of that time, especially on the, towards the end. Um, and what you can see very, very clearly by just looking at the graph in one second is an inevitable conclusion. Inflation spikes rents. For all of those 10 years, uh, rents were 3x the norm. And notice uh, halfway through the, the graph, the moment inflation fell in 1983, 1984, after Reagan was elected and came back down to norm, see how quickly rent growth returns to norms. And it stayed there pretty much for three decades until 2021, which was obviously a crazy, uh, bizarre sort of year. But otherwise, you can see the consistency of rent growth. It sort of stays 1% above inflation. I don't believe inflation is going to come back to 2%. I think we're going to be living with you know, 3%, maybe 4% inflation. I can tell you, it may not happen this year. In fact, I'm, I'm predicting flat rent growth for this year. And we can talk about why it's going to be flat this year. But in the future, there's very strong evidence that rent growth in the US tends to either be at inflation or above. In most cases, if you look at that 74 to 84 time, it's about a, a percent above on average, right? So if inflation is going to be at 3%, rent growth in the US is going to be at 4% beyond 2023 for maybe 2024, 2025, maybe even 2026 before we return to norms. And that's exciting because 4% rent growth solves a lot of problems that multifamily has right now. But that's what the data on the screen suggests to me. Well, that's certainly uh, good news to real estate investors. And it's good news to me. So I hope that your uh, I hope your predictions are correct. Um, what would you say, you know, to counteract those that believe that because we've had such significant spikes in the rent growth, that what we're, uh, you know, doomed for is an absolute crash? Why do you believe that that is not the case? And how would you actually counter that perspective? Um, because there's no fundamental change in demand. So the demand for multifamily is spiking for one simple reason today. And I just showed you a graph, right? Today, the gap between home ownership and, and renting is the largest in history by a very, very long amount. So there's, there's significant demand drivers that basically are putting a floor under multifamily. Now, multifamily clearly has problems this year. But multifamily's problems that we see this year are fundamentally interest rate issues. And they're short term. And I say short term, I, I'd say, you know, the next 15 months, the next 18 months. But that doesn't change the overall fundamentals. The fundamentals of the marketplace are extremely strong. They're very, very strong. And I think that we're going to see that. Now, having said that, every market has to pause. And I think this is going to be that pause year. This is the year where salaries catch up. As you know, salaries in the US are growing very fast right now. We're at somewhere between 4.8 and 5.2% annualized growth. So if you get 0% rent growth this year, let's just assume we get 0% rent growth. That'll give some time for salaries to catch up. Also, there's this consistent myth in the US that says, <clears throat> if my salary only goes up 4% a year, or let's call it 3% a year, because that's that's more sort of the norm. If my salary goes up 3% a year, I can only afford 3% more in rent. That is complete and utter nonsense. It, there is no mathematics in that statement. It's just a rule of thumb, right? I get 3% more in, in income, therefore 3% more in rent. What we've seen so far is rents traditionally are about 30% of your income, right? So let's say I got a $3,000 raise, right? So most people think, oh, I can now pay $1,000 more in rent. No, what we're seeing is this, that as incremental salary increases happen, all of that money, every single dollar is only going to three places, food, rent, gas. So basically, almost a 100% of those increases are just going to three things. And of those things, clearly rent's the biggest portion, right? You know, gas is expensive, but nowhere near as much as rent. So what is actually happening is that almost all of Americans' raises are going, 50% of them are going into rents, which means that when I get a $3,000 raise, 
I can actually afford $1,500 more in rent. So this means that if my, my income is increasing by 3%, rents can increase by 4.5% endlessly. Is this good news for Americans? No, because that means that our standard of living is not improving. As our salaries are going up, there's no change to our standard of living. We're not putting any more money towards a vacation. We're, we're essentially becoming a poorer country because all of those dollars are going into food, rent, gas, right? So from, am I happy about that? No, but it, it's important to understand that this can be done indefinitely. For the next 10 years, if I get $3,000 of increases every year, I can put 1,500 towards rent. And that means that rent growth can grow 50% higher than my incomes. This is not just an assumption. This is what happened in the last five years. How did we <clears throat> get to this point? We've had years of rent growth being 15%. Where did that money come from? People didn't just make it out of thin air. People just put more and more of their, their, their salary increases towards rent. It's by far the largest component. Not good news for the US, but good news for multifamily investors. Yeah, Neil, I'm, I'm curious too. So you mentioned this year, you, you're assuming rent growth at 0%. Um, is that nationwide? Or are you seeing that in specific submarkets or um, areas where supply is seven to ten percent of the the existing stock today? Where where, where do you see rents um, softening compared to the the thirty percent trade outs we saw in in twenty twenty one? It's complete. So that zero percent number, maybe even one percent. I think rent growth actually in the U.S. is going to be positive. So I'll I'll change my number. Right. So I'm going to say this: many of the preferred markets in the U.S that have a large amount of supply coming in because we have an astonishing supply overhang in the next 12 months, the largest in history, uh, are likely to see negative rent growth. So minus one, minus 2%. And Phoenix is because it had you know early supply compared to let's say Atlanta or, or Dallas where the delivery is sort of more like in the second half of this year. Um, and you, we've already seen, seen negative rent growth in, in Phoenix. You know, I, I think it's down maybe three or 4% not a big deal. I mean, Phoenix obviously had the fastest rent growth in the United States in 2021. So a little bit of retrenchment is always good. Otherwise, everything turns into a bubble. Um, so I think the answer to your question is yes, I do expect to see overall in the US positive rent growth. But a lot of the places that we talk about on this podcast are actually the ones that are going to take a bit of a hit this year, because the last two years have been insanely good for them. So I expect the hotter markets, I, I see a lot of delivery coming into Austin, into Dallas. Uh, Dallas might be the, actually one that escapes this, but we'll see. Um, but uh, there's a lot of de uh, delivery coming into Charlotte, Raleigh, uh, North Carolina, South Carolina markets, into Florida markets. And I think those are the markets that we are going to see some negative rent growth. Not crazy negative rent growth, but you know, 2%, 3% negative rent growth. Some markets might be as much as 4 or 5% down. Um, overall, rent growth in the US might be higher. In fact, my numbers show that rent growth in the U.S. is going to be highest in Rust Belt markets this year, which is very rare. Rust Belt markets tend to trail, um, you know, these big markets. And that's why they're ahead this year, because they tend to be pretty slow. They're, li they're like the steady eddy. And because you, they're steady eddy, there's no need for them to retrench. They just keep going on that steady eddy pace. But this year, the steady eddy pace might be 4% or 5%. Well, it, last year it looked pretty awful. This year it looks pretty awesome. And where, where do you see the, the largest opportunity for rent growth on new leases or renewals? In terms of markets or, or, or in terms of classes? In, I guess that's a great question. So I'd say market wide, where do you think there's a, a greater opportunity burning off the existing rent roll um, through renewal increases or catching it on the new lease side? I think that it's, it's really on the renewals. On the new leases, I am not confident that we're going to get the numbers because the market for the moment is in going to be in balance. In the second half of the year, in many markets, there's gonna be supply. Even in the smaller markets, there is some supply coming in. So I'm not convinced at this point that our renewals are going to make us um, a lot of money. Uh, sorry, uh, our, our new leases are going to make us a lot of money. I think that renewals is where we need to be fairly focused on. So we'll see what happens. I could be wrong on that, but, but that's my, my thought at this point. Very insightful. And <clears throat> I actually agree. I've also been saying that I think that uh, asset management has become more critical now than it has been for, for several years. And that's one of the reasons why. I'm curious to know too, you know, all of this is great advice for investors that are looking for opportunities that are up and coming. But what would your advice be to investors that are already passively invested in multiple deals and in a number of these markets that we've referenced today? What is your advice to them? Um, 
So imagine that instead of investing in, uh, you know, so let's say you're you passively invest in four or five deals. Um, I want you to, for a moment, compare those deals and what has happened in those deals in the last six or seven months to your favorite technology stocks. Not the stock market, but the, your tech favorite technology stocks. Maybe you like Netflix, maybe you like Google, maybe you like Apple. You look at those stocks and see what has happened to the NASDAQ. The NASDAQ's down about 30%, so that's tech index. Multifamily in the last 12 months has been like that. We've given, in the last two or three years, truly spectacular returns to our investors, right? Now is the time for our investors to support our business. And, and I think that's what investors need to be in that support mode, because what is going to happen is in the short run, because of these extraordinary increases in interest rates that, by the way, nobody foresaw. If you're thinking, why didn't my multifamily syndicator see this? You simply have to go back about 15 months ago and try and read what Goldman Sachs was thinking, what Bank of America was thinking, what Wells Fargo was thinking. I'm yet to find any analyst that basically forecasted where we are today. Nobody, absolutely nobody thought that inflation would be this sticky and that the US economy would be this strong. So given that this is a extraordinary time that the entire economy is going through, there's no portion of the economy that is, is, is left you know, unhurt. Right now is actually a time for you to support your syndicators because they've given you extraordinary gains. And if you believe that, well, your syndicator should have known better, then I don't think you're an investor. I think you're a speculator. You sort of then maybe should be trading you know, options or doing things like that. Investors understand the core benefit of what they're investing in. My question is this, right? Ask yourself this one question. Because of what happened with COVID, right? So from before COVID to after COVID today, do you think multifamily has a better value proposition or a worse? I think the only logical answer is it has a better value proposition because of the astonishing increases in home prices. The, the, you know, the, that gap has spiked so much that the value proposition is better. Now, in the meantime, you know, because interest rates are up, that value proposition is temporarily suspended. But it's only temporarily suspended. How long? I don't know. Maybe for 12 months, maybe 15, maybe 18. The point is, the market is likely to return at some point, and I'll call it late 2024, to the point where we start seeing the value proposition again. And I think if you stay on the line, and if you go and research what happened in 2008, 2008, rents went down. 2009, they actually went down. You know when they went back up, what happened? They went back to the original trend line. So we never lost any dollars. We never lost, lost any momentum. Because when they went back, they went back to the original trend line. So we were still on that same trend line upwards. And I think that that's going to happen to a lesser extent here. So this is a time for patience. There are no great deals out there. So if you're with a syndicator and you're thinking, I'm going to go to some other syndicator, why? What, what difference does that make? This is a systemic issue that 200 countries are working on all at the same time. I don't think that other multifamily syndicator lives on Mars or the moon. They're going to be affected just as much. Yeah, Neil, I think you said, it. I mean, even even coming out of NMHC, um, the, the the topic was survive till 25, right? I mean, you, you heard that all the time. Um, and I'd be really interested now that we're talking about interest rates. How does the interest rate environment impact the BTR industry um, of, of bridge loans and, and financing? Financing costs are up. They're up very substantially. So I think that what, what you're seeing there is no different from what um, we're seeing in the multifamily industry, right? So uh, here's an anecdotal concept to give you sort of an idea of what's happening in, in the industry. And I'll, I'll start with, with value add, right? I, I spoke with a very well-known broker in the, in the Texas market, he, in the Dallas market. He's, he's easily number one or works for the number one company. He said, Neil, how many properties do you think were on sale in Dallas uh, 12 months ago? And I said, how many? He said, 50. And, I, and he said, how, how many do you think are on sale today in Dallas? And I said, you know, I've heard from NMHC that 78%, you know, volume decline. So 22% of 50 is six. He says three, right? So today, 85% of the volume has simply disappeared. It doesn't exist. It's gone. Well, in the construction side, it hasn't affected us 
that much at this point in time. Uh, but I think that construction volumes are down by maybe 40%. And I think that they're going to go down by 50% before the, the end of this. And that is good news because it's not just BTR. BTR is still very small, right? So we're talking about in, instead of 40,000 units a year, we'll make 20,000 units, big deal. But there's multifamily construction tends to be around 300,000 units. If that goes to 200,000, we've dug a 100,000 unit hole for 2025. And the single family market tends to be about 800,000 units. They're down 40%. That's a 300,000 unit hole that they're digging. If they dig that for two years, then in 2025, we've got 600,000 unit shortage. Now, these numbers may not be that bad, but my point is that the single family market, the BTR market, the multifamily market are all slowing and they're all going to dig holes, which I don't think benefit us today, but they benefit us in 2025. Very well said. It is a long game. I've been uh, definitely kind of screaming that from the rooftops lately. It is a long play, a long game that we're in. And, and right now is a great time to be patient. And I really appreciate your insights that you shared with us, Neil. Now, yeah, yeah. before, uh, before I, we jump into our lightning round questions, sure. is there any other, you know, last point that you really want to make sure you have the opportunity to share with our listeners? Yeah, one, one slide. I have one last slide that I wanted to share with you on the screen. So this slide on the right side in the table, for those of you that can see, basically is showing the astonishing difference in incomes needed to buy a starter home in the US. So the column 2020 shows like Tampa, you could buy a home for $32,000. Two years later, uh, for $32,000 in income. So that Tampa was cheap, really, really inexpensive for a starter home. Now it's 72,000. So Tampa's up 123% in two years. People were lucky if they got 6% raises in a year. So that's 12%. Look at all of these markets. And if you're thinking I'm cherry picking, just ignore all the markets and look at the line at the bottom. That's the United States. Our incomes in two years needed to have gone up by 88% in two years. I think the average American got a raise of about 9%. This is why renters have to rent for longer. This is why an entire generation of American, 20 million families, are unfortunately going to be renters forever because this catch up is almost impossible. And I do expect some of it will happen as home prices decrease this year, but it's not gonna go back to where it was before 2019 because that would mean home prices would need to go back 30%. And the home price market actually, the single family market is much better in a much better place than multifamily. With multifamily, we have bridge loans, we have rate caps expiring, we have all sorts of challenges. So we have to sell our properties and that moves prices down. But everybody that invested into the single family market had access to sub 3% rates. So everybody got a 30 year fixed rate lock. So they can just sit there on those properties and not sell. So I don't think that single family prices go down by more than 10%. If you look at this chart at the bottom where it says plus 88%, let's say you know we see a 10% decline in homes. We still need a 60% increase in incomes in the last two years to afford that same home. It's a huge, huge statistic. This, is, this isn't an 800-pound gorilla. It's an 8,000-pound gorilla. Absolutely. <clears throat> the data speaks for itself. And the best thing that we can do is, is actually uh, be very strategic and you know, capitalizing on that the best that we can, frankly. Uh, so the data speaks for itself. Thank you very much for pointing that out. All right. Well, Neil, we have arrived to the lightning round questions. I know you have played this game with Ellie before, yes. but if we have new listeners. And since technically I didn't get to ask you last time and people do change over time, it'll be fun to do it one more time. Are you game? I'm ready. All right. So when you're not being a mad scientist for multifamily, when you're not doing build to rent and developments, when you're not reading the news and studying all kinds of data, what do you actually do for a hobby? My hobby is life hacking. I'm interested in improving every aspect of my life in unique and interesting ways, whether that's around travel, around health. I'm constantly looking to life hack my, my life in every way. Uh, my guru is Timothy Ferris, um, who writes big books like The 4-Hour Workweek. So I now work, thanks to Timothy, I work about 28, 29 hours a week, but I get a lot more done because I employ a team of 18 people in the Philippines on a full-time basis. They don't all work for me, but four of them directly work for me and I keep them extraordinarily busy. So I'm able to generate about 200 hours of work in, uh, in uh, a week, thanks to them. Then that's the work part of my life hack, but I'm constantly life hacking every other aspect of my life. 
Sorry, not a lightning answer, but. No, that's inspiring, actually. I like it. Um, but it's going to make the next question a little harder. So what is something about you that most people don't know? Um, I, uh, I was, uh, you know, diagnosed as a borderline autistic when I was nine years old. And everything that I see in front of me is always represented in numbers. I see numbers in everything. Wow, that is fascinating. And uh, I, I, fascinating. I mean, I'm even kind of jealous. I, I think that'd be so interesting. Uh, very cool. All right. Now, you already kind of touched on it earlier, but is there any other book that you would recommend that it's really important for investors to get into their library? Absolutely. You know, even though the four hour work week is a phenomenal book, I wouldn't have read it if I didn't practice the Miracle Morning. I'm not sure if the Miracle Morning is the best book of all time, but it is the most enabling book of all time, because if you practice the Miracle Morning, you'll have time to read dozens of books. So you'll find your best book by reading and following the Miracle Morning. Awesome. OK, great. All right. Now, you know, one of the goals, obviously, um, for all of this is obviously making money, but there's so much more than just making money. It's not just about the money, right? So what is your advice to people that are really dedicated to building an extraordinary life? I think um, remember that why you started to build the life, because what I find is that people that are chasing this in the process of chasing the extraordinary life, they forget the life itself the process becomes their, their go-to. Never forget that. I mean, I, I, I'm never ready to go back to working 55 hours a week. I'm pretty happy with 28 to 30 hours a week because that's what I was after. And I think for you, it may be different. Maybe it's 40 hours, maybe it's five hours. So don't remember, don't forget the end goal because in the end, it's all about quality of life. It's not about how much money you make. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. And last but not least, Neil, if people want to get in touch with you and find out a whole lot more, uh, how can they find you? Um, two ways. Um, I'm the only Neil Bawa on the World Wide Web. So you can type in N-E-A-L space B-A-W-A -A into Google and you'll see lots of my content. Um, we do uh, 20 webinars a year that are on lots of interesting topics, uh, multifamily, single family, BTR, climate change, uh, deglobalization, all kinds of very interesting topics, you know, return of in, uh, industrializations to the U.S. So those 20 webinars are watched by about 26,000 people, and they're all at multifamilyu.com. That's multifamily followed by the letter u.com. All right, perfect. Well, Neil, this has been fantastic. We have so enjoyed having you. And Ryan, thank you also for jumping in today. My pleasure. And for those of you listening, thank you for tuning in. I hope you found this to be very valuable, inspiring. Make sure to tune in again next week. And until then, don't forget to please like, rate, review the show. Let us know some more things of what you're thinking. Be strong, be bold, and keep moving forward.